welcome everyone. These are really exciting times and I can't stop myself from looking forward. Things are moving. They're, they're moving fast and we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into some major news here in a minute. But before we do, I'm hoping you'll indulge me in a little bit of reflection. Nelson Mandela says, remember to celebrate milestones as you prepare for the road ahead. And I think it has some value for us to remember this, not only because of what we've gathered to talk about today, but because of all of our other collective accomplishments as a community of practice, as ecosystems, and as individuals all working together for gains in STEM opportunities for all, especially our nations historically underserved. As I look around the room, and I mentioned this before, but I'm really excited to see that I see a lot of new faces. So make sure you open up that chat. Let us know who you are, what organization you're with. And if you're not part of the STEM Learning Ecosystems Community of Practice, it's a mouthful. So what is the SLECOP? There are a hundred ecosystems around the world, and these ecosystems vary dramatically in how they're conceived and what they focus on. But they have a few things in common, primarily that each local ecosystem brings together K-12 education, higher ed, business and industry, funders and foundation, out of school time organizations and more to determine what the common needs are in the region and then work together to pool resources and tackle those problems. It's really incredible to see in action and we at the SLE COP bring all these ecosystems together to learn from each other, to grow and to support initiatives. So now that everyone knows what an ecosystem is, let's take just a quick moment to celebrate a small number of the many milestones you've all achieved. It's an honor to work with each of you, a group so dedicated to leveraging the power of STEM to transform the lives of individuals and entire communities. And to me, perhaps the biggest milestone this year for the SLE COP happened earlier this year with the creation of the Leadership Coordinating Council, or the LC2, the group made up of ecosystem leaders who are helping to bring the SLE COP into its next iteration. TIES continues as the backbone organization, of course, but this group of amazing ecosystem leaders, the LC2, has taken hold and is helping to steer our work. And we're joined this morning by Judd Pittman, chair of the LC2. Judd is one of our nation's top leaders in ecosystems and their development. His work with the state of Pennsylvania and other ecosystems across our, ne our network have been transformative. He recently transitioned from the Pennsylvania State Department of Education to join Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology to continue and strengthen K-16 initiatives throughout the state. Thanks for uh, joining me today, Judd, and helping to, uh, to field questions and monitor the chat. For those of you joining us live, Judd is a great resource for any questions about the ecosystem initiative, and we'd be happy to interact with you in the chat. But also, Judd, I'm hoping that you can quickly share with us some of the other big milestones that the SLE COP has achieved this year. Uh, Jeremy, thanks. I, I really appreciate it. And that was a really kind introduction. And welcome everyone from, uh, from across the world and across the country to, to celebrate today. And uh, no better time than, than right now for this conversation, considering the, the topic of discussion today. But you know, we do want to talk about those milestones. And in response to the pandemic, ecosystems across the globe have found innovative ways to support students, their hardworking families with high quality STEM experiences. Opportunities like those captured in STEM at home required novel and collaborative approaches to get STEM resources to the communities that needed them most. So now we're gonna drill down into some specific examples and talk about some of the, the great things that our ecosystems across the world have done to support scholars and communities during this pandemic. Neo STEM developed a program where it hired high school students to teach small business owners the basics of operating a business online to keep their business alive during the pandemic when folks weren't able to come in person through their doors. STEM NOLA offered hybrid programming for some of the community's most vulnerable and marginalized students, meeting community needs and demands for safety and fun learning experiences. Greater Cincinnati STEM Alliance quickly delivered STEM kits to homes of hundreds of families in the region to keep learning going while outside of the traditional school setting. And in my home state of Pennsylvania, 10 of the STEM ecosystems came together to power a collective network known as the Pennsylvania Statewide STEM Ecosystems that produced bi-weekly webinars to support teaching and learning. And it also helped to accelerate efforts with our Pennsylvania PBS stations to bring learning resources to educators, caregivers, and scholars through their television and computer screens, along with grabbing go, go kits for those communities that had or lacked access to the internet. 
And then our most rural communities, our, our North Country STEM network or our North Country STEM ecosystem, their leaders sprung into action to create much needed PPE. They took uh, 3D printers from libraries and schools across the region and put them in the homes of leaders to design much needed resources for their communities. Now, this is just a quick snapshot. And there have been hundreds of these examples across each and every one of our STEM ecosystems across the globe. And these milestones have occurred during the beginning of the pandemic, throughout the pandemic, and even through to the day. And it's been against all odds in the midst of these conditions that these hundred communities in support with SLCOP to continue to meet the demands, the needs, the wants and the desires of students, teachers, caregivers, families, and communities with authentic STEM learning experiences. I would encourage all of you to look into the chat and grab the STEM Ecosystems Annual Point Annual Report where you can find more of these stories and connect with leaders like yourselves across the globe and replicate the great things that are happening within your community and communities like yours. Jeremy, I'm gonna turn it back to you. John, thank you so much for those highlights. And I know that there was, uh, for those of you listening, there was a list of about 50 more things that all of these ecosystems are doing. It was really hard to pick just a couple of highlights, but it's something to dig into. There's so much good work happening all around the country by the people on this call and the people who aren't on this call but are part of this initiative. Speaking of moving, uh, we have an agenda today, kind of a jam-packed one. We're here today to learn more about the Strengthening STEM Ecosystems Act a bill that was introduced by two U.S. senators last week. And if passed, the bill would give the National Science Foundation $25 million to award to STEM ecosystems. We're dropping a link to a press release that we wrote about the bill, which includes additional details in the chat now. Make sure you download that uh, to, to read and to use. In addition to diving more into the bill, we're also gathering today to talk about the plan for helping ensure that every member of Congress knows how important STEM ecosystems are, and that they understand the critical nature of the work that you all do. Finally, we'll of course have time for questions. So as you've heard me mention already twice, I think in this call and a dozen times before, make sure you click that Q&A button down at the bottom, get your questions in, get them in early, and maybe most importantly, look at other people's questions, vote them up. We tend to only have a limited time for questions. Uh, so those questions that are most voted up uh, are more likely to be answered live. I'd like to next ask Jan Morrison, founder and CEO of Ties, to offer a few words about the Strengthening STEM Ecosystems Act. Jan? Thanks, Jeremy, and welcome, everybody. It's um, wonderful to see the numbers here and to see your names fly in front of us. Um, so we're welcoming everybody who is ecosystem, but we also see, con Jeremy, we see content partners are here today as well, and um, partners that are interfacing and helping our black and brown children, um, shepherding them to a life of STEM through uh, universities, and, um, and our partners also in social mobility. So we have a wide range of audience here. So I'd like to address that for a minute, if I can take a second to take us back a minute to remind everybody that we always talk at the ecosystem level and community of practice about inclusive voices. When we speak about that, we're often talking about a ground game, but in our minds, we know that part of our ground game includes our elected officials. Those Congress folk who we, who, who we, some of us get very close to, who come from our own ranks and those who don't, who are in there in Congress, who are representing us. So how does this actually, this kind of relationship develop? Well, it's been intentional over a number of years. This is not a random, um, a, a random event that we're all together here today. In fact, it started many, many years ago when our government in coordination with all of us decided to create a strategy for STEM every five years. And in fact, the last one had the ecosystems as the top um, selection for what all, all communities around our country should actually have in a strategy for moving ahead STEM for all children. It also includes NSF and colleagues on the co-STEM agencies that have recognized the importance of, eco, of your ecosystems, of the community of practice in the work that they're driving, the research they're driving, the innovations. It also is a matter of the, the STEM Next Fellows that are now um, firmly in the agencies to help information come to agencies and for um, you to understand what agencies are doing throughout our federal government. 
But really last year at this time in January, we got together in a town hall and we said, what is our voice? How do we operate together? What are those questions that we really are raising? And how do we actually get questions and issues in front of our elected officials and of the agencies so that we become a single community of practice, inclusive of them? And over this year, Jeremy, we have had the drive to actually meet that out. And that's where the loose coupling of ecosystems with our, with our government has been a past way of thinking about things. Current is much tighter and much more important together. So I think what we're gonna hear today um, is very exciting. It demands action of us all, but it also requires and is an invitation for us to understand what, um, what has happened and, what, and the opportunity we have before us. So thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to say something now, and I'm eager to hear what, what James and, and his folk have, have want to say to all of us, as well as what our questions are coming from the field. Thank you, Jan, for being such a great resource to all of us. And now joining us to give us a deeper dive into the bill and to discuss the next steps in the legislative process is our friend and great mentor, James Brown. Uh, James, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for all the work that you did on behalf of the STEM ecosystems and advocating uh, for the, this bill uh, to be drafted and introduced by Senators Kelly and Moran. Um, you put in a lot of hours on this and we deeply appreciate it. So this is the big question. What's next? Well, I think one of my key goals is to figure out how to get walk on music on every podcast and webinar I'm on in the future, Jeremy. I appreciate that very much. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, you know, this is a really big deal for the ecosystems community, right? We've been fighting for a long time to try and get the federal government to recognize the power of these community organizations and the emerging network of STEM organizations and, and its potential to influence the kind of outcomes that we care about. And this bill is a direct product of that conversation. And so, you know, the, the, I, I, sus I'll, I suspect I'll date myself by talking about Schoolhouse Rock, but, you know, now we have a bill on Capitol Hill and there are a lot of stages to make that bill a law. And, uh, you know, the, the dollars associated with this will only become a reality if we rally around this cause and figure out how to work it through the legislative process as a, as a unified whole. And I think that starts with making sure your elected officials are aware about this legislation. You know, there are something like 12,000 bills introduced in every Congress. So while it's great news to us, it's just another day on Capitol Hill for most of the people who work, work up there on Capitol Hill. So I think job number one for the ecosystems community is to get familiar with this piece of legislation and then get your elected officials in Congress familiar with this piece of legislation. I think it in some ways sells itself in the sense that, you know, Judd's survey of some of the activities ecosystems have done you know are are by their their own example examples of the ways in which ecosystems can contribute to their communities and the the notion of adding additional federal support federal assistance to those ecosystems can only amplify those kind of outcomes so in many ways just talking about who you are and what you're doing and letting your your members of congress know this bill is out there is in many ways selling it the best way we can James, you know, um, we're going to go to questions from the audience in a little bit after we hear from a, another colleague. Um, but but I've got a couple. And, and I think maybe the most difficult for you to answer is also the one I'm, I'm most curious about. What do you think the chances are that this happens? What is the likelihood that this bill gets passed? You know, <clears throat> um, there are a bunch of different ways to answer that question, right? We could be really cynical and say, well, of the 12,000 bills that gets introduced, maybe 10 or 12 of them, you know, get written into law every given year. But the but the reality is, you know, Congress sees the wisdom of investing in communities along these lines. Look at the last year and a half of investments in communities from the federal government, and look at the, you know, look at the need for skilled workers. Right, those needs are acute. So, um, you know, Congress is debating lots of legislation that involves these same concepts. So there's certainly the opportunities to get it done. Jan alluded to, you know, the, 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 the federal government's recognition of the STEM ecosystems. I think that's, that's very much a bipartisan recognition, and the Biden administration was consulted on this bill, so I think they're bought into the concept of, of supporting ecosystems. And, you know, I think the chances are very good that over the next several years you could see something like this become law, 
and be something that would be broadly supported. You know, the National Science Foundation supports grants that are like these grants, but nothing that's the same as these. And so I think there's definitely a case to be made for why the National Science Foundation is the right place to fund it. So I think we have a lot of assets on our side, right? It's never easy to get this done. And I, I don't think it will happen you know, in months. It's probably going to take a couple of years to get this program off the ground. But this is a good place to start from. Now, James, I know that uh, before we move on, we're, and we're going to dig a little more into this with our with our next panelists, but uh, we spoke a little while ago about the impact of stories and the importance of stories to illustrate the power of STEM and STEM ecosystems. And uh, as we talk about that here in a minute, I'm curious from your perspective, if you could talk first a little bit um, about why that's important. What What's the impact of these stories? And what's the difference between um, uh, different types of stories and how they can help us get this message across? Well, I think one thing that that maybe the STEM ecosystems world doesn't appreciate is how novel this area is in terms of the, the realm of public policy. You know, most of the folks who are on this call have been working with their organizations, you know, for, for a number of years, you know, it's just assumed that this is what we do in the STEM community and we're growing this from the bottom up. But I think within the education policy world, there's not a widespread understanding that there are lots of thriving locally based community organizations that support STEM education. And I oftentimes use the sports analogies, you know, to talk about how this manifests in communities. You know, if you're if you live in a in a school district that has a competitive football team, whether statewide or district wide or however it works, you know everything about that football organization. You know how many, how, what the gym resources are, you know where the coaches were from, you know who's being recruited, where those students play, which colleges they go to, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a parent and you care about football for your kid, you know everything about that, including the injuries on the field, right? So we know everything about it. I think if you use the analogy of STEM ecosystems are in part, part of that same support network for quote, going pro in STEM, which is a whole lot easier than going pro in football, you know, that people understand the value of those emerging community based organizations that are going to keep tabs on how the local school system is doing around STEM outcomes are going to help recruit resources to support those things are going to make it easier for teachers to thrive in those communities. And all of the analogies are sort of valid, right? Nobody wants to coach a high school football team that doesn't have a, a really good support network in that local community. So if you have a really good support network in STEM education in those local communities, it really does make a difference for attracting more excellence and more resources and more assets that students can take advantage of. So in my mind, the best thing that we can do is, is make sure policymakers are aware of the potential of the so-called STEM ecosystem, right? That's a term that we know well and nobody outside this community knows that well at all. And we have to accept that and, and go talk to policymakers about this one of those 12,000 bills. Perfect. Thank you for all of that. And, and I know as I'm looking to the questions, there's several that I think you're going to be able to help us dig into once we get to questions in a little bit. Before we uh, meet our last panelist, our final panelist, keep looking at those questions. I see some good ones coming in. Make sure you're posting questions as you come up with them. And also make sure you're voting up those questions that resonate the most with you. There have been many who've been instrumental in helping to get this bill introduced, uh, including the amazing Martha McCabe from KC STEM Alliance and Ann Zimmerman. Thank you both for your work with Senator Moran's team. I'm now going to introduce Jeremy Babender, a man who's been with the STEM learning ecosystems community of practice since our very earliest days and is one of our key leaders. Now he's on the LC2, and that's not all. But for Jeremy, this bill might not have gotten introduced. Jeremy was working closely with Senator Kelly's team to get the bill drafted and introduced. Jeremy's the director of the Arizona SciTech Institute and a true leader in the STEM ecosystems. Jeremy and his team founded the Chief Science Officers Project that many of you have heard of and participated in and are responsible for driving countless other innovations and initiatives that are making a real difference in STEM in our country. Jeremy? Oh, good. Yeah, good to see everybody uh, today. <laughs> Just a funny intro. So you want me to provide some background or where, where you, you're muted right now? I'm sorry, guys. My audio just cut out for a second, but I think I'm back. Um, so, Jeremy, just one really quick question for me, and then I'm hoping you can stick around with James to field questions. Uh, I, I know you've been working with Senator Kelly for some time. Can you tell us what you've been doing? What's that relationship been like? 
So it's really been, I think it's been a really fun effort. You know, we were, we were connected after the initial front work that the uh, STEM ecosystems have been doing to identify a Senator that would really fit kind of as our champion. And Senator Kelly is a great, you know, great example of that. He's a prior astronaut. So he kind of embodies STEM. He's really kind of centrist in a way um, in terms of his interests and policies. And so it was great that it happened to be our ecosystem that, that there's interest, but he of course wanted to know what's happening with uh, ecosystems in Arizona. So through that, it gave us an opportunity to get to know uh, the Senator and really help work with his lead, um, Catherine, uh, to help really get them aware of what STEM ecosystems systems were. And so she hadn't been familiar with kind of this work. And so through a lot of conversations, we were really able to help work with her on making sure the legislation really had a broad perspective in terms of how it worked beyond just K-12, but throughout the entire communities. And to really make sure that it integrated with workforce and business and community. And I think that was really essential to make sure that it was a bipartisan effort and not just viewed as only K-12. And so that was the first part, but I think the part which was really exciting and, and really demonstrates the power of our community practice is that they really were committed that they needed a Republican to, to um, join in the bill. And so that became kind of a challenge, right? You know, with, with how divided um, how divided the Senate is. And so we, you know, I just, we just started reaching out to every ecosystem that had, had an R. And what was really um, awesome was how many ecosystems, and I imagine many of you on the call responded and was really interested to reach out to their local representatives. Some of, you know, we were able to connect with some of them. Some of them were like, hey, we like it. We're just not uh, in support of funding a bill, um, but we still generally like the idea. And, you know, some of them really were like wanting to make things happen. So for example, Kathy in Florida was trying to figure things out. We're talking with Nebraska, we're talking with Kansas, we're talking with many, many, many places. And we're lucky that Martha McCabe, um, when at advantage, she's got Kansas City, she's got four senators. And she was able to identify um, Senator Moran to really champion it from their perspective. And so it's, it's really due to that grassroots level connection that we were able to really make that happen. And so I think that really is going to tie into the next steps as James is talking about, which is how do we get this above the radar? And, and I think it's because we have this grassroots level uh, community that can really take it to that next level. And so now that it's there and it's passed and there is a Republican on board, I anticipate it's going to be a lot easier to get more uh, support from both the uh, the congressional reps and the, the senator reps. Um, but, you know, I, I really would just encourage everybody to think of ways that we can continue to tie together and really build our connectivity as a, as a community practice. What's exciting about all of that is we know everyone on this call knows this is a this is a bipartisan effort, helping kids, helping communities, helping economies. This is something that everyone can and should get behind. And, and I love that we're part of that work of, of bringing people together to make some positive change in this country. One more part to today's formal presentation. It's going to be a quick one. Alyssa and our ties team, as well as our colleagues from STEM Ed Coalition, are working on an advocacy toolkit, as well as collecting stories of impact from ecosystems to help with all of this work. Alyssa, can you talk a little bit about what you're planning and what's available? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jeremy, Jeremy, James, everybody, uh, Jan um, and Martha and Anne and everybody that's helped us get to where we are today. But at the root of why we are where we are today is, is all of you and the ecosystems that make up this incredible initiative. So what we want and need right now, um, even though, you know, James has cautioned us that this is a long process. You know, we're a little bit of an impatient lot. Um, and we want to immediately begin sharing stories of impact. Stories that illustrate how your ecosystem has truly made a difference, you know, in the communities and the individuals that you serve. And so we're totally agnostic about how, what platform you use to send these stories into us. They could be little video clips, they could be blogs, they could be you know, full-blown feature stories. They could actually just be pictures with expanded cut lines. Um, we have set up a, a Google form, of course, um, and we will drop that in the chat right now. Thank you, Lauren. And we're asking you um, to be pretty intentional because we're anticipating gathering a ton of content about how you label. Um, if you could make sure that you, and I hate to, this is not my thing, um, make sure that you put your ecosystem name 
you know, in the in the file that you save so that we are very careful about um, categorizing this information. We will, as we collect this stuff, we'll, we're planning to sift through it and get back to you in the coming week to 10 days with some immediate next steps. Also going into the chat next is a link to an advocacy toolkit that we have been working on with um, James and, and the STEM Ed Coalition where it has some resources, including a customizable press release that we ask that you immediately send in to your press contacts um, and to use for social media as well. There are sample letters in there, as well as sample social media content that you can use. Um, okay, mm -hmm. um, Jeremy, I think that that is the high level. We'll touch more on this, I'm sure, in the Q&A coming up. Alyssa, um, can you talk, uh, you, you mentioned a deadline. Can you talk, what's the deadline for all of this, this work? Do you really want to know? Yes. Yes, Yesterday. Today. Thank you. All right. So let's get that in. Uh, sooner that we have it, the better chances of getting it ready to package and share. So the truthful answer is here that there's no absolute deadline, but we really need this no later than the end of the week. Uh, we'll keep taking the stories of impact beyond that, because the plan is to share them on the SLE COP website and in social media over the coming weeks and months. There's a lot going underneath the hood that you'll be hearing about over time, about uh, the ways that the ecosystems, the SLE COP wants to be uh, amplifying the stories and messages of impact. So in addition to the stories of impact, we're also working on an advocacy toolkit that we'll be releasing on Wednesday. And now I'm hoping that we can start with our questions. And the first question that I'd like to throw to, because it's something that I'm really wondering too. You know, I, yeah, many of you know that I work uh, some with the NeoSTEM ecosystem here in Cleveland. And so I'm hoping that uh, Sandy can go ahead and talk to us a little bit about her question. Sandy. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, just a quick question. And that's what can we do locally to really help push this legislation along? All right, so Judd, I, I saw you um, in our little back channel. You kind of mentioned that you'd you'd like to dig into this first. Um, from your perspective, in your in your new role, in your old role, what should ecosystems be doing now to make this happen? I think I think exactly what Sandy and her team have already done, which is uh, reach out to your to your senators and reach out to your representatives uh, to build the support. I know Sandy's team was one of the first to reach out to Senator Toomey here in Pennsylvania to try to garner support around it. Uh, invite them to events, you know, reach out, um, not only through their email, but try to try to get a visit in person to talk with the staffer, you know, find that staffer that may become your best friend so that you can be the information expert for them. I mean, that's ultimately what we have as our resource is, is knowledge is power, information is power, and making sure that we're sharing that with our, our legislative partners and their staffers. And Jeremy, what, what about from your perspective? I, I know, you know, you're already doing a lot of work, obviously, to get this started. But for those ecosystems who weren't part of that initial genesis, what, what do you hope that they're doing to, to make this vision a reality? So we, we've been striving to pass local legislation in Arizona, too. And I think part of the conversation, you know, I, I typically find the Democrats are not as, you know, concerned about adding money, money bills. Um, you can talk about education, but I think often you have a challenge, you know, there can be a challenge with people that are more the conservative spending side. Why do we want to put more money in here? How are we going to spend it? Um, and I think it's really about thinking about the money that's already invested in into education, into CTE programs, into business, and really making that argument that this is really helping to leverage the existing dollars and it'll bring it more. Because I think what we have to do is point to that five-year STEM plan and looking at all the different organizations that have embraced this. And so if we don't have this basic level of infrastructure, um, we're going to lose out on, on bringing in those funding. And we've been kind of pointing to a lot of states that we're still kind of in awe of how well they've done in terms of passing legislation like Idaho and uh, Washington and, and uh, Oregon, um, Nevada. You know, there's so many places around Indiana that have done exceptional work at the state level that this helps to really level the playing field that many places nationally can still make this happen. And so I think that argument has been helping when we're speaking with representatives. And I, you know, I know uh, Jan's always ringing the bell about workforce and the importance of tying things to workforce. Is that tr hold true for for this work? Should it, 
is that the language that helps or or what should people be focusing on as they're talking to the representatives? You're looking for me or Jan to answer that one? You, Jeremy. I mean, I think, again, it just depends on who you're talking to, right? I mean, we, you know, we're anchored at a um, at two business-based organizations. And so for us, workforce is really one of the most important discussions, you know, as we have places like TSMC, you know, coming to Arizona, Intel's building out. It's exceptionally important for these groups. Lucid's another example. They're moving to a smaller rural community called Casa Grande. They're telling me they need 6,000 new jobs in the next three years. And this isn't just like a suggestion that we need people. This is like urgent. If we don't have the people, we're going to be in real trouble. And so having the ecosystem that helps to pull together the business community, government collaborators in Casa Grande is essential for them. But us having the ability to really even have those conversations to make it happen is, is essential. And so those are the arguments. It was really interesting when, when the uh, legislation was in its first um, in the Commerce Committee in Arizona, actually the, the legislator that oversaw Casa Grande actually even specifically talked about that. And he threw out the jobs and, and all these pieces. And he was a Republican um, representative and really did recognize that need. And so I think it really is using that language about workforce development um, and leveraging those resources. Thank you, Jeremy. James, uh, Lindsay has a question that, that I think, I'm hoping that you can shed a little light on. Lindsay, are you willing to ask your question real quick? Sure, um, thank you. Lindsay, I think you're muted. You weren't for a second. There you are. You're back again. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, first and foremost, I'd just like to thank everyone um, that's had a hand in making today possible. So thank you so much. It's, gonna, it's going to make a great impact. Um, my question is, um, what would the general parameters be for the $25 million in funding? Sure, I can, I can answer that question. So... Um, one thing I'll do, I, I can actually post the bill language in the chat. It actually appeared on the Congress's website over the weekend. We have a bill number. It's S3636. So we can figure out some way to riff on that title. But uh, so, Lindsay, the, the simplest answer for this question is, so NSF will structure this as a competitive grant competition. We've laid out the eligible partnerships for that competition in a way that every ecosystem that's a formal ecosystem would be eligible, but lots of other organizations that are STEM organizations and combinations and networks of those STEM organizations would also be eligible. So it's a very broadly defined partnership that's designed to capture you know, lots of organizations at the state and local level that are working in partnership with their states and local communities. So we wanted to be very inclusive there. And then the set of activities I'll just read you a couple to give you a flavor for how this reads and, and how this uh, how this would manifest itself. So the first listed activity is to support convening STEM learning stakeholders to review and assess statewide or regional STEM education needs and practices, share best practices, and bolster existing programs or develop new programs and other means to address such needs. Does that sound familiar at all? Um, you know, that's an example of the kinds of things that the ecosystems are already doing. Here's another example, um, perhaps from a little bit different angle. So one of the pieces of feedback we got to the point about the workforce conversation was another support activity, convening STEM learning stakeholders to support state level workforce planning to ensure alignment between STEM learning activities and workforce needs. So speaks directly to the previous conversation about aligning workforce needs. Um, so I'll, I'll post the link to the bill so you can read it about a little bit more. It's got a lot of flexibility for how ecosystems would operate, but it's modeled on the existing network of ecosystems that are out there and a large part of their needs and also trying to give um, those ecosystems standing inside their states to advise state plans around how workforce needs are determined, state funding priorities are determined, and how federal funds are used. Well, thank you so much for that clarification, um, especially on the eligibility. My client, Let's Go Boys and Girls, is based out of Maryland. So we're not an ecosystem per se, but highly recognized. Um, and so we certainly are excited to take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. James, um, you know, kind of while you're on the topic, I, I know that you answered sort of directly a couple questions, but I'm, I'm hoping you could speak to them a little bit. In particular, is there a house counterpart that we should be thinking about here? Because uh, we're going to have to get there eventually. And with that in mind, what's the, the fastest timeline that all of this could happen? 
Well, let me cross my fingers and answer both those questions. So we are having a conversation with two house offices. I mentioned this in one of the chat responses. So the two most interested house offices are Representative Young Kim of the Los Angeles, California area. She's a Republican. And Representative Rahul, Rahul Grijalva, who represents Arizona, on the Democratic side. Their offices were already talking to, and uh, you know I won't speak for them, but I think they're they're likely to co-sponsor this bill in the House. It won't be hard to find co-sponsorship in the House once you've got you know a pretty excellent set of sponsors in the Senate. So you know I'm not worried about that. The the, the second part of the question, I'm really going to cross my fingers hard and say the best earliest opportunity is uh, to include a part of this bill or all this bill in the so-called competitiveness legislation that's been passed in the House and Senate is now going to the conference between the House and Senate. And back to Schoolhouse Rock, you know, the House passed a bill called the America Competes Act, and the Senate passed a bill that's called uh, the United States Innovation and Competition Act. Both of them have lots of funding for things like R&D and semiconductor manufacturing and education programs. And uh, there's, there's a chance we can get something on our bill inserted into that product when it comes together in the next, you know, next month or two. That would be the earliest we could get something done. You know, in high school, I was in Schoolhouse Rock Live. Uh, I'm not going to sing. I'm just a bill, but I do love it. Well, um, the, let me just yeah, add one other thing, though, Jeremy. That's part of the reason why Alyssa made the point about we want to get these things together now. You know, you go into this with both an opportunistic approach to take advantage of opportunities when you can, and there is a good opportunity now. Um, but you also have to look at this as a long-term thing and not be disappointed if things don't work out in the short term. So if it doesn't go into that bill, it doesn't mean the end of it. Um, it just means that we'll look for the next opportunity. Now, speaking of opportunities, I know that a lot of times these uh, these bills, particularly ones that go through NSF, are really, really focused on, on research and research practices. And this one's a little bit different. And Jeremy, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about the ways that it's different and uh, why that's important and how that impacts the work that the ecosystems do. Yeah, I think this was part of the, the process of the back and forth. And so, you know, originally when we got the bill from Catherine, I was like, this is not going to really help us as, you know, a lot of the thing about the ecosystems is we get things done, right? We work, we move things on the table. We're not fully focused in immersion of research. Although research is, is good, we have research as part of it. It was really biasing it towards education, K-12 education, and it was biased toward doing a research study. And so I really had to push very hard, making sure if you fund this, you're just going to get more information that we already know for the most part. And so we did a lot of back and forth. And I think she even scrapped a lot of the initial legislation and rewrote it to really make sure that it tied into us not just doing research, but really how do we move our ecosystems forward? And I think that's an important thing that we continue to push. Um, especially as it goes into NSF, because there is going to be a bias towards, you know, having evaluation research, which is still good to, to validate that. Uh, but I think what's unique about our work here is that we really want to see change happen in the community and build those partnerships and collaborations. And so there was a lot of that back and forth, but really pushing the, the workforce angle. And I think that really was a piece that was helping also to get that bipartisan uh, representation. You know, Jeremy, uh, one of one of my focuses and passions is computer science, computational thinking, and we've got a question from Joe Kamach. I'm not sure if I uh, did your last name right, Joe, but Joe, can you ask your question and tell me how to say your last name? Uh, my last name is Kamach, Joe Kamach. Kamach, um, got it. Uh, I, I think the question you were, were, were referring to was the second one that I posted, and that is uh, basically is, is uh, computer science explicitly been mentioned in this in this bill in the discussion of the bill and that kind of thing given the fact that uh, uh, it's uh, pretty clear that uh, perhaps two-thirds of the new stem jobs over the next 10 years are going to be in computer science so that I think that's probably yeah the best Jeremy do you uh, it, with the bills it stands now in, in your involvement, is there a computer science specific component or does that just fall under the overall umbrella of STEM? It's my understanding it's general, but James maybe probably be better to answer that one than me. So I just posted something in the chat on this. Um, there's a definition of the STEM subjects in the bill and it includes computer science. Great question. Right. Can, Jeremy, can I yeah. jump in here for a second? Of course, of course. That's really highly intentional. And I think that's an important piece for everybody to understand as we move ahead into this third decade of what STEM is, um, that CS is 
part of that it, we're we're one community. Yeah, I know there, there's a sometimes there's some separation, but but we in the ecosystems don't believe that that's valid. In fact, most of our work requires a lot of times with computer science, um, and these are these are our allies and our friends. So so I'm glad to see that this is sort of all linked together. James, I, I'm curious. Um, what, if any, connection is there between this bill and the Supporting STEM Learning Opportunities Act introduced by Congresswoman Hayes and Congressman McKinley um, and, and others? So another great question. Um, if you look through Congress and you look at that 12,000 bill list that's out there, you'll see there's a whole bunch of bills on STEM education related topics. So that is one of several. And the intention behind that bill is a little bit different. It's, uh, it's specifically written to be focused on national networks of organizations where you have, um, where you have the same organization that's present in, in all 50 states. So, and it's also intentionally written to support um, what I would call the Boys and Girls Club type models of activities. So non-academic focused STEM models is the primary focus, meaning things like first robotics competitions and Boys and Girls Clubs and out of school activities. Um, and that's a bill that's already been introduced in the Senate several, several times in the past few years and was originated by First Robotics. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm curious now if we could dig in a little bit um, to the selection process, James, for, for this. I, I know that Wendy's got a uh, question. Wendy, are you there with us right now? So yeah, Wendy's quite, oh, there she is, hey Wendy. Yes. Yeah, so my question is just about the selection process. So uh, I work at, um, I'm in Louisiana, part of Network. Um, we've noticed over the years that NSF in particular tends to pick the big players. You have to have a lot already established to be able to get NSF dollars. So it's gonna, it's gonna kind of focus on big and not maybe be as equitable for ecosystems that are smaller, really trying to grow. So what, what's in the language of the bill to help make it more of an equitable selection process? I can take that one, Jeremy, if you like. Sure, James. Uh, so it's another great question. And you raise a really good point that, that there've already been discussions with NSF about. So one of the things that happens when you put these bills together is the text of the bill was actually shared with the National Science Foundation. And the program they pointed to that was most similar to this was the NSF Includes Alliances Grant Program, which is exactly the kind of program you're concerned about ecosystems not being very competitive for. It's very focused on higher education. It's awarded to researchers and it's only awarding one, one two or three grants a year over the past several years. And the distinguishing mark about this bill was that it, that it's, it's specifically intended to support community-based organizations and not just those in higher education with a research base. So that's written directly into the structure of the bill. And it may not seem, again, this is another thing that, that makes a lot of sense to us, but is an impact on policy you know, within the government that's, that's more significant than we might appreciate, which is the bill has a definition of an ecosystem and of a STEM stakeholder and of the structure of this that is different than how NSF normally looks at those communities, because you're right, they focus on research and research institutions as their primary audience. This is very much community-based organizations as the eligible partnership. So we're trying to navigate that territory in a way that makes community-based organizations the most competitive. Uh, James, I, I also know that there's a, uh, a women's uh, STEM caucus meeting tomorrow. Um, as we're thinking about advocacy and moving things forward, is there value in, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you know already, this, this, uh, this organization is filled with brilliant and connected and inspirational women doing some really great work. Is there value in connecting that work? And if so, what's the best way to, to make that happen? You know, the, the, so the, Congre the Senate Women's and STEM Caucus is a new entity, right? This meeting that's going to happen um, in the near future is really their first meeting. And, you know, I think that's an important audience for this. I think so many of the programs that are focused on STEM education and emerging programs are focused on women and minorities and recruiting people who are not, you know, who are not, who are underrepresented in the STEM fields already. So it's an, an incredibly important angle. 
And I think, you know, there's there's an emerging network of women legislators led by Jackie Rosen and Shelley Moore Capito, the two chairs of that caucus, that definitely care about these issues. So, the you know, the more we can connect with folks who are in Nevada and West Virginia and others, that you look at the membership of that caucus in particular, we're going to have a footprint everywhere. It's an important constituency. And it's something we should think about being intentional in our advocacy around. Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder if it would be value for us to kind of flood things like that, make sure people see uh, the work that's being uh, that, that's being done by by this organization. Judd, I'm I'm wondering, you know, it, a lot of folks here are, I, I think, in their minds already thinking about how they can advocate for the the passage of this bill. Um, can you talk about a couple examples of the type of impact that the ecosystems have had, either nationally or regionally, that those folks might want to highlight as examples of, of this work? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, one of the things that we want, want to be intentional about, much as James was mentioning, is if you have events or opportunities that showcase your impact to historically marginalized communities or show the impact on equitable access to STEM learning experiences, they're the types of events or experiences that we want to showcase. Uh, showcase the, the diversity of the community, make sure that we are sharing stories that represent small ecosystems, that represent large ecosystems, that represent rural, suburban fringe, urban ecosystems. We really want to show uh, the diversity of this network. So it isn't a bill just for, for some or a few, that it's really a bill that's supporting all communities and all learners and raising the, the economic boat for, for everybody involved. Uh, that's probably one of the most critical pieces. And being really intentional about when you tell those stories, doing your background research on either the legislator, the senator, the congressperson, uh, the, the staffers to know what their interests are and trying to tie it to their interests so they get excited about it um, and can find, you know, like any good educator, they can find their hook into the process and 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 really be supportive of, of the journey forward. Um, specific stories, you know, I was talking to Exan this morning and one of the things that I thought of, which uh, we were just chatting around was, you know, as, as the pandemic unfolded in, in, in Pennsylvania in March of 2020, there were so many conversations that we had with community leaders or with superintendents or boys and girls club partners or, or economic development partners that if it wouldn't have been for the network, that they wouldn't have been able to mobilize and support communities and scholars and caregivers as quickly as they did. And a prime example is in Butler County, Pennsylvania. Uh, if it wasn't for the Remake Learning Network and the Pittsburgh STEM ecosystem and the relationships that they built with their county commissioners and the local hospital and the local universities, they wouldn't have been able to do food distribution to, to, to students as quickly as they did because they used their storage spots. They used the community college as a vehicle for hosting leftover food that they wanted to get in the hands of students. So even when we're, even when we're outside of the STEM arena, that ecosystem approach or those ecosystem networks are so valuable and they enhance communities. Um, and I think that's the, the thing to remind our, our leaders is that it is about STEM, it is about economic vitality, it is about workforce development, but it's also about really good community building and, and relationships and being able to be uh, dynamic in decision-making. That's what these networks bring to, to communities. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I also know that a part of the power of the ecosystems is that broad diversity in makeup. You know, something that I always thought interesting as somebody who wasn't here for the, the very beginning of the ecosystem project is we're really bad in this country about thinking that there's single answers for everyone. And what Jan and, and, and the others who, who started this whole initiative really had in mind was that each region needs to be made up however it makes sense because they all have very different needs and i think that's a really important message to get across is that this work is already thinking about uh students and young people in every portion of this country i, I we, we had some questions um in particular one from uh catherine around um how do i find other people in my region who are doing this work that i could collaborate with how do i find if somebody's already leading it Veronica, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the best ways for people to connect with each other through the ecosystems in order to, to push this work forward. 
Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. And Catherine, I did put a link in the chat for you for the New Jersey STEM Pathways Network and connecting with Kim Case there who runs the statewide initiative um, that would be useful. I also think, I believe her name was Lindsay who was in the state of Maryland. We do happen to have an ecosystem actually in Baltimore and a link that I'm gonna throw in the chat now, which would probably be your most useful if you feel a little bit like an outsider is to take a look at the list of ecosystems that are there on our site. There's a map, there's a list of everybody. And if you click into somebody or a region that seems close to where you are, you should be able to either reroute to their website, find contact information for somebody um, to get in touch with them and to do a little sleuthing. Um, if by chance you still can't figure that out i would highly encourage you because that's probably where we're going to send you first um, but you can always email us at info at stem ecosystems.org and we may be able to put you in direct contact if you're struggling to find those people those folks um one of the things that james mentioned and i think we've mentioned this before in in our work is that building relationships before you need them is really critical and so i think this is for folks trying to plug into leadership and the other way around as well um starting to convene folks around what you're doing what your goals are getting really concise language um even ecosystems itself tends to be jargon and so starting to get that concise language down as a unit as a group as a region to systematically start to communicate some of the great things that you are either accomplishing or hope to accomplish, I think would be really useful. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, we threw a few other resources in the chat. That advocacy toolkit also has some links at the end that could be really useful as well in building relationships. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Veronica. And you, uh, if you've been coming to this for a while, you know, I really like to end on time, number one. And I also really like to end with a round robin question. So I'd like a, to ask this question to, to the four J's, Judd, Jeremy, Jan, and James. Um, and the question is this, and we're going to, Jeremy, start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, what are you doing next to move this forward? And what should we be thinking about? So I'd like to ask all four of you that question. Jeremy, what, what are you, what are your next steps and what should our next steps be? So from our end, we're, we actually have a trip planned to DC already. We're going to be going in March. And so part of that trip is going to be meeting with our different legislators. So, you know, from us, you know, Grijalva is a good friend of ours. I think he'd probably make a lot of sense for us to connect with, but we're going to talk with all of them about this at the national and local level. And so that that's going to be the, the first bit, but I think we're going to continue to work with Catherine and Senator Kelly's office to continue to provide her examples of what's happening in Arizona. So that's that's kind of what we're doing in Arizona, in addition to talking with our local state representatives. And so I think similarly, you know, it's it's probably behooves everybody to be vocal about what's happening with their their state representatives um, in, the, in the different areas. And I think if you're, you know, trying to figure out how do I connect with them or how do I work with them, that could be something where I imagine you can reach out to the, the STEM ecosystem. Um, or the, the ties team. Um, we actually have a group that's helping us at the national level that might even help work with you as well. Um, and I think there's also opportunities with a lot of the, um, the earmarks that just came back with, um, with representatives that this could be something that ties even into it so that it might be kind of leveraging an earmark with getting that STEM ecosystems money nationally. But there, there's a lot of good reasons to talk with your legislators, especially now. So important, so important also when you can, when you can afford to, to visit them at their house. It uh, makes a big difference. Uh, Veronica mentioned in the chat, make friends before you need them. This is this kind of thing is why we've been saying for two or three years, if you don't already have relationships with the legislators that cover your area, make sure you build them. But if you haven't yet, this is a good conversation starter to make that relationship begin. Uh, Judd, what about you? What's your What's your next step and what should our next step be? I would encourage folks to go into their 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 senators' websites, find out where their local offices are. Uh, you know, they all have emails that you can send an email note to them about the bill. You know, make sure you put in the subject line the Strengthening STEM Ecosystems Act, so it, can, it you know ignites their interest. Uh, send that email and then follow up at each of your local offices with an in-person visit or drop a letter. Uh, that's some really concrete things that we all can do, and the more that we put that. Uh, that 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 idea in their ear, and the more they hear it from more folks, the the greater likelihood that they're going to continue to support the effort moving forward. Absolutely, Jan. What about you? What's your your next step, and what should ours be? Well, thanks so much, Jeremy. I want to point out that Jeremy Bevinger is the uh, vice chair on the LC two for policy. So his invitation to help on this to all of you is serious, 
and will keep the leadership of the community of practice involved in, what, and in your activities um, on the ground in the ecosystem. For me personally, I am headed and have been working with the beneficiaries. What happens when this all works? When um, who's the beneficiary in its business and industry globally, locally, regionally? And what can they do now since they already have the structures on the legislative side to be working with um, the appropriations committees and all the various um, coalitions that are on both sides of the hill? How do they actually spend their time? Are they knowledgeable? What are their questions? So I've been spending a lot of time with business and industry and will continue to do so. So critical because not only if this passes, do we need the infrastructure in place to get the money to kids and make real change, but also when you're talking to the legislators that cover your area, if you can show that these conversations are already happening, that the infrastructure is already in place, they're going to be a lot more receptive, I think, uh, to moving forward in the work if they know that it's going to make big impact. Thank you, Jan. And finally, James, what's your next step here and what should ours be? Well, you know, it's funny. People can hear you talking sometimes when you're on these webinars. The staffer for Representative Grijalva emailed me while we were uh, in this session to talk about next steps on that process. So we're going to work this very hard from inside the Beltway. Um, and I, I, you know, and I, and we'll do our best job to, to make sure the folks inside this bubble of Washington get the message. But the most important thing we can do is mobilize this big network. We're nothing if we can't get this hundred 100 ecosystem network involved in punching in its weight in this process. If we do, we'll be in a really good spot. Thank you, James. You know, I think there's a lot for us to do here. It's very exciting. I'm going to mention one I wasn't, but since nobody else did, I'm going to, did, I'm going to throw back to Alyssa's mention earlier, stories. We need your stories. We need those impact stories. We need them soon because that's part of the way that we as a, as a larger ecosystem uh, collaborative are going to be able to work this, uh, move this work forward. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, James, Jeremy, Jan. James, Jeremy, Jan, Alyssa, Veronica, uh, Judd. Judd's the other J, I forgot. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you've done for us and continue to do. Make sure you're looking out for that advocacy toolkit. Make sure you're submitting those stories. And as Alyssa mentioned in the chat several times, make sure you go ahead and email info at stemecosystems.org if you have needs or if you have things that you think you can provide to make this work uh, happen and make this move forward. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.